great example of how Protestants are exactly like Catholics. Why? Because he was really big into defending infant baptism. Now, it's funny his initials are R.C. Sproul. I think that's pretty apropos because I think we should call him Roman Catholic Sproul. R.C. Sproul, Roman Catholic Sproul. Why? Because he was a Catholic. Because where did you get that baptizing babies from? That's not something that came from God. That's not something that came from the Bible. That's something came, that came from vain traditions. And did you know that R.C. Sproul has renounced all of the tenets of uh, Calvinism? And I said, but he's dead. That's the point. He no longer believes that anymore. Now he knows the truth. But I thought about that as, you know, that is the truth. He now believes just like we believe. Now, I don't know where he is, but wherever he is, his doctrine has finally gotten straightened out. Hello, Jeff Dollar here. I'd like to answer some of the accusations against R.C. Sproul. Uh, first of all, I'd like to look at the question as to who was R.C. Sproul. Uh, he's a theologian who recently passed away. He is one who has made much impact uh, in the evangelical world through his Ligonier Ministries. Uh, R.C. was from my neck of the woods, at least close to there, from the Pittsburgh area. Uh, his teacher, uh, Dr. Gerstner, uh, was a former teacher of the church that I attended for 10 years in Johnstown, the Trinity Presbyterian Church, uh, where uh, Dr. Gerstner would teach Bible studies. Uh, so we are uh, somewhat familiar with R.C. Uh, we uh, mourned his death. We feel his loss. But the question comes up here that is brought up by uh, Mr. Stuckey and some others concerning R.C.'s theology. Was R.C. actually a Roman Catholic? Now the uh, question is, what exactly makes a person a Roman Catholic? You know, a few uh, years ago, there was a controversy uh, in the evangelical world concerning a document called the uh, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, which was signed, I believe it was about 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, which was going around signed some very, by, by some very prominent evangelicals, which was trying to find common ground between Roman Catholics and evangelicals. Uh, those who opposed it, there weren't a whole lot of vocal opponents uh, in, in the major evangelical world, the major leaders of the evangelical world, but several of them uh, were uh, Dr. John MacArthur and uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul had a meeting with those who had signed the documents and had uh, expressed his opposition, forcing them then to ch actually change the document and re-sign, actually to, to form another document and sign that as well uh, because of the problem of, of uniting with Roman Catholics. So, you know, the question that, that because a person is a Protestant like R.C. Sproul, that automatically makes them a Catholic because the forefathers of that, that particular denomination were one time connected to it. You know, such as uh, Presbyterianism with John Calvin or uh, John Knox. You know, that, that somehow connects you to the Roman Catholic Church and that we still have an affinity with the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that historically is uh, actually very foolish the greatest opposition to Rome uh, in history it came not from anybody that we could associate with a, a IFB doctrine or anything like that, uh, the, the Arminian type doctrine, but it came primarily from the Protestants, from the Calvinists. You think of the Reformers? You think of somebody like John Knox, who was a Presbyterian, who actually suffered as a galley slave because of his faith. He was able to escape that and came back as a preacher uh, to oppose Queen Mary in Scotland. And she greatly feared him. It said that, that she had made the statement that she feared uh, John Knox more than the armies of her enemies. You know, and John Knox was a Presbyterian, or what we would call a Protestant. You think of, of John Calvin and the opposition, the opposition that he faced from Rome, the Puritans, uh, the, the, who sprang from the Reformers. Uh, the pilgrims who came to America had a great disdain for Rome. And there's actually a civil war 
in Maryland, which you won't read in your history books. It was something that would be considered very small, but I think is very significant. During the English Civil War, there was much uh, antagonism between the Roman Catholics and the Protestants, and there was groups of Roman Catholics in Maryland, and there was Puritans in Maryland. And the <clears throat> Roman Catholics decided that because there was a war going on in England, it would be a good opportunity for them then to attack the uh, Puritans. And they, they did so. They went to war with the Puritans in small groups. And the uh, battle cry of, of these men was, Hell to St. Mary's and wives for us all. And they attacked the, the Puritans, the Puritans who knew what was coming. Uh, there was even a little naval engagement between a, a, a boat or two uh, in, in this little battle. And the Puritans were successful in defending themselves from the Roman Catholics. The Puritans, of course, were Protestants. So this whole idea that because you consider yourself a Protestant that you're connected to Rome is utter and complete foolishness. It comes from a total ignorance of history and theology. Let me read to you from the Westminster Confession of Faith, just to show you how foolish this is. Most modern uh, IFB folks will talk about the Antichrist as being a future person who's coming uh, that's going to cause all kinds of trouble in the future and whatnot. Uh, the Protestants had a different view. And, uh, when I talk about Protestants, I mean uh, this would include also the Arminians such as John Wesley. Uh, this was the view that they had concerning uh, the Roman Catholic Church and specifically the Pope. This is the Westminster Confession chapter 25 and paragraph 6. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalteth, him, exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. Now that is the official position of the uh, Presbyterian Church, or has been uh, in, in history, uh, concerning the Roman Catholic Church. Now you tell me, does that sound like, like something that would be Roman Catholic? Total and complete foolishness. Uh, just one more thing concerning Roman, Ca uh, Roman Catholic Sproul. I'd recommend uh, this book it is getting the gospel right. This was actually written uh, in response to the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document that was signed. And he goes into the gospel. What is the gospel uh, and how it differs from Roman Catholicism? And I'd highly recommend that. At this time, I'd like to take a look at a video clip of Dr. Sproul in explaining this. And you decide for yourself, does this sound like a Roman Catholic to you? The Roman Catholic Church has changed since the 16th century. There's no question about it. And the differences that we had in the 16th century have changed. They're far greater now than they were in the 16th century. All the Mariological decrees have come since the Reformation. The De Fide proclamation of the infallibility of the Pope came since the Protestant Reformation. Things are not getting better, they're worse. And in the recent Roman Catholic Catechism of the decade of the 90s, all of the essential issues of the 16th century debate were reaffirmed in that catechism, including the treasury of merit, purgatory, indulgences, justification through the sacraments. So when people say the, the Reformation's over, they just don't know what they're talking about. It's that simple. They don't know Roman Catholic theology. So then does Roman Catholic sprawl sound Roman Catholic to you? The second part of this, this video, I'd like to look at the issue of infant baptism. Now this is one thing that I remember hearing when I was in the IFB, constantly being heard, was that a person who baptized babies was connected to the Roman Catholic Church. And I remember as a young student uh, actually making fun of a Methodist minister who was connected to our church through the friendship of the pastor. And I was uh, rebuked by the pastor for, for my uh, rudeness to this man, but uh, th but the the idea of my mocking came from this idea of infant baptism. How foolish could, would somebody be to baptize a baby? They must be connected to Rome. It's, the problem with that is that there is theological reasons for that. Uh, uh, does simply baptizing a baby make one a Roman Catholic? Well, 
Rome also believes in other things. Rome believes in the Trinity. You know, I have heard in some of the split-offs of the IFB, uh, some anti-Trinitarian people that uh, would point to this. Well, if you believe the Trinity, that makes you Roman Catholic. Oh, really? Or perhaps maybe there is some scriptural basis for the Trinity. Uh, just because the Roman Catholic Church believes it uh, doesn't mean that if you're a Trinitarian that you are a Roman Catholic. Uh, Rome believes in the deity and humanity of Christ. If we believe in that, does that make us a, a, a Roman Catholic? Of course not. It's complete nonsense. Uh, infant baptism, if you want to get an idea of how a believer could believe in infant baptism, you have to go to the Old, old Covenant, or the Old Testament. And you go back to the Old Testament and you, you see how that at the, on the eighth day that the Israelites circumcised their children. Well, the people who believe in uh, infant baptism uh, believe that that concept is carried over to the New Testament. There is a continuity between the Old and the New Testament. some discussion earlier about, about being tolerant and intolerant and all of that and we live in a time of the relativation of truth and I've always said in this discussion with respect to the debate between infant baptism and believers baptism is that the first thing we have to understand is that the New Testament nowhere explicitly commands the baptism of infants nor does it anywhere explicitly forbid the baptism of infants. And so whichever side we come down on has to be dealt with on the basis of implications drawn from the biblical text. And though we differ on this, I think that the judgment of charity requires that when we do have this discussion, that we understand that those who think that babies should be baptized really are convinced that it is the moral duty of the Christian to have their infant children baptized. And on the other side of it, those who don't believe in infant baptism truly believe that it is not the proper way to exercise the sacrament. And that both sides have to respect that the other side really wants to do what is pleasing to God. We just differ with respect to what we think is most pleasing to God. Now, since both of us want to be pleasing to God, and we differ on what is pleasing to God, should we discuss it? Should we? debate it? Of course. Without rancor, without division, but with an honest inquiry and discussion, acknowledging, I think, my Baptist friends want to please God, and they don't think infant baptism pleases them, and I think it does, and so we differ on that point. But it is important, because every article of truth is important. It's not the most important thing. Obviously, we differ on that here in this panel, but what we believe that what unites us is far greater than what divides us. That's why we're standing together on these things. And finally, I'd, I'd like to close out the video by challenging you. Now, you say if you're involved in the new IFB movement or in uh, the, a, a group which is very similar to that, uh, a, maybe an extreme fundamental group, I would encourage you to pull as many sermons as you can listen to uh, from your types of, of pastors, the pastors that, that you follow. Listen to those sermons carefully. Even take notes. And then go and do the same thing for Dr. R.C. Sproul. Of course, I, you could apply this to uh, any of the what we call the Protestant uh, preachers. Uh, Dr. John MacArthur, Alistair Begg, uh, there, are, there are others that would be involved. Paul Washer, for example, you could do that. I'm not saying I completely 100% agree with everything these men teach. Obviously, uh, we have our differences. But I challenge you, take the, the sermons from your, your preachers. And then take the sermons of Dr. R.C. Sproul. 
listen to them carefully, and then compare them as to the scriptural content and the theological understanding that comes out. Now listen to Dr. R.C. Sproul's series on Dust to Glory, what's called Dust to Glory. Uh, which gives you a, a comprehension of, of what the scriptures teach throughout uh, the entire Bible. It gives you an overall, over, uh, a, a, a bird's eye view, I guess you'd say, of the entire teaching of the Bible. Go through that series. Uh, you can go through his series on apologetics. I challenge you to do that. Listen uh, to that series. And you will come out of that a much stronger believer, a much stronger Christian, a more knowledgeable Christian. You're not going to get sermons on on why it's wrong to, to breastfeed in certain areas or, or why you should cut your hair a certain way or why you should use a particular version of the Bible or why this preacher or that preacher is wrong and then we'll spend a, a very long period of time and perhaps even uh, use insulting language against these preachers. You're not going to find things like that. What you're going to find are in-depth studies of the Word of God and the theology. Now what is theology? Theology is simply taking the scriptures and what they teach and systemizing it into categories and then understanding these categories. That, that's what theology is. There's a, a doctrine of God, a doctrine of man, a doctrine of angels, a doctrine of salvation, and so on. Uh, R.C. is a theologian. That's what he does. You will go through these, these series, take note of the depth and scriptural understanding that he has, and then compare it to what you're used to listening to. You're going to find a very severe difference between the two. I challenge you, you will not be the same if you do that. So then, in recommending R.C.'s books and series, I'd like to include this as well. I've not been able to completely finish this book, uh, but it's a book which will do, do you uh, a, a great uh, amount of good if you were able to read this book on the holiness of God. Uh, you'll notice a great difference in how the so-called Protestants like R.C. Sproul approach God as compared to the people within the new IFB and others. Uh, there is a, a an almost uh, nonchalant type of an attitude towards worship in these churches. You won't find that with R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul teaches, at least he taught, a, a very strong and high view of God's holiness and righteousness, which is really necessary to understand if you're going to, to become a believer in Christ. You must understand the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man before you actually understand your need of Christ. Now, I'd like to close this. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll close it with this last video by R.C. on what exactly is the gospel and why people need the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this and compare that to what you've heard before. And you'll see that uh, R.C. Sproul was not a Roman Catholic. He had a very good understanding of what the Bible teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ, about grace, about uh, salvation, and about faith. Once again, I want to like to thank you for your time, and may the Lord bless you in your search for truth. 45 seconds for the person that tuned in just to this program that would like to have his sins forgiven and have Christ's righteousness imputed to him. R.C., how does he do it? In 45 seconds, I would say his only hope of being forgiven and restored to, to a relationship with God is to confess his sins, acknowledge his sin, and, and repent of his sins, and look to Christ and to Christ alone, who is the only person who is sufficient to give him what he desperately needs to be reconciled to God, that Christ will cover your nakedness, that Christ will supply the righteousness from himself and grant you all of his righteousness as a robe to put upon your nakedness. And by, if you would receive him by faith and trust in his righteousness, then you will be received by the Father into the Father's house and adopted into his family.